This year, an estimated 230,000 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Nearly 40,000 of those women will lose their battle with the disease. But the hereditary genetics that took up so much of the spotlight this week are, in fact, only a small part of the risk factors that will determine who will receive that diagnosis and who will go on to survive it. As it turns out, your risk is determined as much by what's in your body as the environment that your body is in. A 2010 study that examined racial disparities in breast cancer mortality rates between 1980 and 2005 found few differences in breast cancer deaths between white and black women for the first decade and half of the study. Then in the early 1990s, researchers noticed a curious trend. Mortality rates for white women started to decline, while the rates for African-American women stayed consistent. The continuation of that trend finds us where we are today. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, while breast cancer deaths are going down fastest among white women compared to women of all other races, African-American patients have the highest breast cancer death rates among all women. And although the incidence of breast cancer remains higher among white women, African-American women are 40 percent more likely to die from it. So, Dr. Peek, this is so much of the work that you do. Absolutely. What is causing these racial health disparities? A lot of people want to focus on potential differences in tumor biology and potential genetics, and I think that there's probably something to be said about that story. But I think the real story, the bigger story, is one about our society and our healthcare system and how we are treating women um, as they get diagnosed, as they get screened, diagnosed, and followed all the way through the treatment trajectory. We see this in other situations. Whenever we have new technology, new treatments, anything that's new that comes out, there's a potential for creating disparities so that those who have money, power, influence, um, know the mayor, can have access to better health care than those who don't. Mm -hmm. And so when, as we have better ways of diagnosing breast cancer, as with more treatments that come out, then populations who are more affluent and advantaged can take advantage of those and start to see decreases in the breast cancer mortality while others get left behind. And this yeah. is the story that we're seeing. Uh, you know, and the fact that the race story maps on, literally maps onto a map story, that there's a geographic story to this as well, that Chicago, where Absolutely. you work, is one of the kind of hot spots of mortality, It but is. also that we see these very high rates of mortality through the U.S. South, through places where um, African-American women often are also living in poverty and simply don't have a lot of access to to health care. Right, exactly. And if, when you look at some of the national studies, they'll suggest that the rates between black women and white women are the same for mammogram screening. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of reason to question those studies. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are telephone-based. Not all black people have a telephone. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the ways that they're sampling patients really um, makes a lot of us call into question the validity of the findings that they're equal mammography rates. And then that's just at the very beginning. We also have questions about the differences in quality of mammograms that people mm -hmm. have, the differences in quality of treatment, the access to treatment, and then once they're there, the kinds of quality of treatment. And so um, breast cancer should not be or is not different than any of the other health disparities that we see. I primarily mm -hmm. study diabetes. We see this in cancer disease. We see this yep. in diabetes, heart disease, HIV. There's significant health disparities in both the kinds of care that women receive and the outcomes that they have yep. in this country by race. Now, I mean, one of the pieces of good news about, about that, though, is if it isn't genetic, if it is, if it is social and political, then it's actionable. What are some of the things we need to be thinking about as we move forward in terms of breast cancer and, and these racial disparities? So so it's important to note that of all women today, white women are most likely to receive a diagnosis for breast cancer. Asian women are less likely, the least likely to screen for it, mm. and black women are most likely to die from it. And as you've said, this is true. This, we're seeing this trend across diseases when it comes to prevention and early detection. That does mean it's actionable. In my own life, I struggled for four years with excruciating pain before I finally got the diagnosis for advanced endometriosis. Many women have to see five doctors wait eight to 11 years before mm -hmm. they receive a diagnosis. And what I've discovered that it's, it's not just economic barriers, but it's a culture that causes women, especially young women, especially women of color, to feel shame about their bodies, to feel shame about their body's dysfunctions, mm -hmm. that if our bodies are not... Uh, sex symbols or mm -hmm. baby makers, uh, we have a hard time seeing that they have worth in and of themselves. And so it's about a culture where doctors and, and medical practitioners and communities are able to encourage women mm -hmm. to seek out the help that they need. Well, I think that's one th reason that Angelina Jolie's op-ed really resonated. I mean, Melissa right. McEwen over at Shakespeare had this great post about how uh, Angelina Jolie's body is seen as sort of collective property, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. She's this international sex symbol. She has a body that is lionized, the ideal 
scale of our society. And so for her to say, I'm both making my body very public, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm putting all of my choices up in public for scrutiny of other people, mm -hmm. and I'm also saying this belongs to me, here's how I chose to make these decisions. That said, it, you know, I think the specificity of Angelina's case, you mentioned, mm -hmm. not all breast cancer is caused by this gene mutation. Mm -hmm. Not all women have chosen the double mastectomy route that she chose, which mm -hmm. is a pretty radical choice. Yep. And it's a specific choice because she has a very high and very yep. unambiguous result to her test. So I think as much as these single stories are incredibly resonant and it is incredibly brave to open up the world's scrutiny to her decisions, and not everybody has access to that care, even once you have access to that care, there's such a spectrum of choices mm -hmm. that you can make, all of which, or very few of which are unambiguous. And, and, and you know, part of what, as you guys are talking about sort of choices and about bodies, you know, one of the tensions here that, that I've also been thinking a bit about is we keep talking about her breasts, but haven't talked much about her ovaries, right? Because the other piece of this is having lost a parent to ovarian cancer and that BRCA is going to increase that likelihood of ovarian cancer for her. And I wonder if there's something about breasts that we think of as public property discursive and maybe also less shameful in part because there's been such a push around breast cancer research for the past sort of 20 some odd years where it's become more public but the, you know, to talk about endometriosis I had, I had a hysterectomy in 2008 as a result of fibroids which many African American women suffer with but, but to talk about uteruses or to talk about ovaries is still something that we don't do so much well, and she is having her ovaries removed yes. that news yep. came out later and I, I'm not really sure why she chose to sort of roll it out but obviously you know that it's a very deadly cancer it's less common, but it's much deadlier, yep. and that has been completely sort of uh, obscured in mm -hmm. all of this conversation. Right, and, and, yet, and yet ovarian cancer might also be something we would want to be talking about with BRCA. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Because ovarian cancer is a cancer that it's extremely difficult to, to screen for. Yeah. Um, it tends to be detected at a very late uh, stage, and that makes it more deadly. Yeah, the mortality rates are much higher. Stay with us. We're going to talk um, more about this, but specifically about the pink washing of, of breast cancer and how that might be both good and bad for what's going on in America.